toe. Which way to go? Well, it depends. Ribosome footprinting or RiboSeq is great for if you want to figure out which messenger RNAs that ribosomes are bound to inside of cells. So all of these different messenger RNAs with all of this instructions for making different proteins, where is this protein making machinery, the ribosomes, where is it actually sitting? And this can tell you things about like what the cells are currently making. But what if you want to know where along a specific messenger RNA a um, ribosome is located? This you can do using a technique called ribosome toe printing, which is gonna be what I'm going to be telling you about today. And this can be really great if you want to figure out, say, is a ribosome stalling at a position at a particular spot? Um, is it starting at some weird places or stopping at some weird places? Um, so I wanna tell you about this technique, how it works, and so show you some um, cool examples of things like bacteria making, um, it being used to study bacteria making antibiotic resistance genes in the presence, only in the presence of an antibiotic. And so you can see that the ribosome actually binds to different places in the presence and absence of the antibiotic. Um, and this causes like a drug to be, um, the dr resistance um, drug to be made. So it's really cool stuff. Um, and so I wanna tell you more about this technique um, as I'm looking into it more and looking into different ways that you can study ribosomes and translation. So let's go. So we've talked before about a couple of ways to study ribosomes and what they're what they're doing. And so a couple of ways are like ribosome footprinting. This is what I mentioned before. This is also called like riboseq, where basically you want to see where ribosomes are located on particular messenger RNAs. Um, there's polysome profiling, where you look to see how many ribosomes are on a particular messenger RNA to see maybe if it's being better or worse translated. Although um, this, there's, it's not always as clear cut as if there's a lot of ribosomes on something, it's being translated well, because you can also have things like ribosome stalling. And so you can see some of this sort of thing when you look at ribosome footprinting. But this is telling you about all of these ribosomes doing all of their stuff inside, like inside of a cell what's going on in there. And so you're looking, you're going to see an average of like all of this information. Um, and so you can get a lot of really noisy data and you can have some problems. And it's also like you have to, it's a lot, it's actually a lot of work. You have to generate a library um, of all of these sequencing things. There's a lot, it's a lot more complicated than you might think. But there are some other techniques that you can use too. So because for this, you're basically getting all of these messenger RNAs. And so this is good if you want to see like, well, what's the ribosome actually working on? And so what's the ribosome actually sitting on and making um, protein from? And so note that another method is like RNA, total RNA sequencing. You often do this in um, addition, like when you're doing ribosome footprinting, you'll like in parallel do the RNA sequencing where you're basically, or the mRNA sequencing where you're basically finding the sequence of all of the messenger RNA. So like how many copies of these? And then you can see, okay, well, how many ribosomes are they on it? And so people are often using ribosome footprinting to get an idea about how much a pro of a particular protein is being made. But you can also use it to get information, but um, you can also get some position dependent information. But if you really just care about like specific messenger RNAs, so maybe you think there's something funky going on in one of them and you want to figure out what's happening. So for example, if you find something with the ribosome sequencing where it looks like maybe there's a holdup, um, maybe you want to figure out what that's, what, what's causing that stall, or maybe you know that there's something that causes a stall, or you know that there's a stall for some reason, and you want to um, figure out what's going on at a more um, in granular level. It's easier to do this if you had some system where you could basically just do this just use this one messenger RNA, make maybe make changes to it, maybe change the availability of various translation factors and um, see what's needed in order to um, recreate the events, reverse the event, um, various things like that. You wanna have a system that's more easy to work with and you, where you don't have, you get more detail on the thing you care about without all the detail about all the other stuff that you don't care about. So you can get higher quality information about that one specific thing, as opposed to lots and lots of information about all sorts of other things, which is important information, but not for the question that you're answering.
And so there are a, couple, a few different techniques that you can use to get information about ribosomes positions. So how ribosome profiling or this footprinting or riboseq works, um, I don't know why it has so many different names, but it makes it confusing and hard to <laughs> search for. Um, but this is, so this is, like I said, this is happening like inside of cells. Sometimes it's actually done like in vivo, so people can take like tissue and actually see what's getting translated inside of the tissue. But basically, you use an you use RNAs. So these are like RNA cutters to cut up the RNA, um, and this is going the ribosome where it's found. Although the ribosome is made up of a lot of RNA, as addition to some proteins, this RNA is like it's like a really stable structure, and so it's not going to get cut up, or at least you really hope it's not going to get cut up. And then when you size select the fragments, you can you can make sure that you get rid of it. And you can also use like RNA depletion methods that I've talked about before. Um, and, but the basic idea is that you cut up around it, you get these ribosome protected fragments where the, and then you isolate the ribosomes. Then you find, you seek, extract the RNA that they're bound um, to and then size select for the size of the fragment. So typically a ribosome is going to occupy about 30 nucleotides long. It depends on the species of the ribosome as well as kind of like the state. So ribosomes can be in kind of like different conformations and those can take up more or less um, space. So you typically do like a range of sizes around that 30 nucleotide range. And then you'll, you can run like size markers for the different species. And as I'm learning, like when you say like, oh yeah, and then you sequence it, it's actually a lot more work. Um, you have to create like these like libraries where you basically can put these linkers and then you have to do this like gel purification and then the gel, another gel pure. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work, um, but I'm learning about it and I'm excited to keep going with it. But this can't give you all of the information that you might want. So with this technique, you're looking at everything in the cell. With the next techniques, you basically get the ribosome to translate a specific template that you give it. In, a, um, in some sort of cell-free system. So this can be a lysate-based system um, or basically the it's a lysate, so you like lice break open cells and then you use what's inside of cells, um, but without all of, um, without actually being inside of the cell. And this way you can, um, you have a little more control over what you're adding and you can add in specific templates. It can also be in like a pure system um, where this is going to basically use purified components. So you basically have the translation components that are were all like individually purified, and then you can um, you like mix them together, and you have even more control. Um, but so there's a really good pure system for e based on E. coli. Um, there is not finding that there's like a human version. Um, there's there's one, but it's like not commercialized. Um, um, but hopefully in the future, because that allows you to have a lot more control, but you can also use like lysate based methods. But anyway, in these systems, often what you're doing is you're, you can either put in a template that is already RNA, um, sorry, yeah, that are ready like messenger RNA, or you can do like a coupled transcription translation system where you put in a template and like that's under T7 polymerase control. And then you put in like T7 polymerase and it'll actually do the transcription inside of the lysate and then the translation can happen from that. Um, but this is just te technical notes. The basic idea is that somehow you're gonna get a an RNA template into there. And then you want to allow the translation to happen. And then you're going to, um, when the translation happens, um, you stop the translation and then you want to see where the ribosome is bound. And so in order to do this, you're, you make cDNA, you basically take where the ribosome is stuck and you want to take, you want to make a copy of the DNA, a DNA copy of this three prime portion of the RNA. So from the, you typically have some sort of, you will have a primer site. Um, so you have this radio, typically radio labeled primer. You can also, um, there's also like fluorescently labeled versions. Um, sometimes this, usually this primer is like labeled at the end, but you can also have it labeled like throughout the whole primer. Or you can use, um, or you can use um, like 
when you're doing the reaction, when you're adding the nucleotides to make the DNA version, you can actually add nucleotides that are labeled so that the whole thing of the whole copy is going to be labeled. But you're going to make a DNA copy. We'll go more into detail on the toe printing in a minute. But this is going to make a DNA copy until you hit the ribosome. The ribosome is going to stop the, R the reverse transcriptase. So it starts where the primers, you have a primer site. The reverse transcriptase is going to copy this make um, a cDNA copy, then you can purify these cDNA copies and do like a sequencing gel and then compare this copy length to the, where it matches in the gel to see where the ribosome was stalled. And so this is going to tell you about this part, um, like which part, where it stalled based on its position compared to this three prime ends. There's also a technique called inverse toe printing where it's going to tell you about the position from the five prime end. So in this technique, basically you use an exoribonuclease. So here you're gonna chew up, chew up to the ribosome. You're not chewing around the ribosome, you're chewing up to it. So this means that it's going to stop at like the first ribosome that it hits. So if there was another ribosome up here, it wouldn't hit it. But then what you're going to do is that you're going to make cDNA of these and you're going to sequence it. What this does is it's going to give you more information about what's upstream. So here you're only getting the ribosome protected fragment, which is about like 30 nucleotides or so. Um, so this is only going to tell you about like 10 amino acids. Because inside of the ribosome though, there's like 40 held. So if you have, um, if you have something going on, it, that further five prime, there might be something going on that's influencing the ribosome, but you wouldn't know based on the RNA, um, if it's based on you, if you were just sequencing what the ribosome was bound to. But when you do this, you can make a lot of different changes to this sequence and see if it affects the translation and where the ribosome is located. And so this, um, and then this is a sequencing based approach. But today I want to go more into detail about this toe printing. And so I'll show you more examples of how it's been used in a minute. But the basic idea is, so this is also called like primer extension inhibition. And so as I mentioned, it uses reverse transcript date, reverse transcription. And so you might be familiar with reverse transcription from doing like um, reverse transcription PCR, RT-PCR, where you make, um, you take, you want to see how many copies of a specific messenger RNA there are. So you make DNA copy of it, this complementary strand with the reverse transcriptase, and then you use PCR to make lots of copies of it. When you're doing this primer extension inhibition, here, you're just using the reverse transcription step. You're not using PCR to make lots of copies of it. But you make this one DNA copy from this RNA, and then you purify it and see where it ends. So it all relies on this principle that the ribosome is going to halt it, um, halt the reverse transcriptase be because the ribosome is bound there. And then what you can do is you can run the sequencing gels. So these are like these really big gels. Um, so here was one from my old lab. Um, they actually have bigger ones too, but you we actually ran this with like a metal screen on it and a thermometer to make sure it didn't get too hot and to make sure that the heat was evenly distributed. And so because um, this is often done with the rate radioactivity and it's kind of low throughput. Um, it's really sensitive, um, but there are also like fluorescent based methods now that some people are using where you have fluorescently labeled um, like primers and stuff or and then you can like run sequencing um, like Sanger se typical Sanger sequencing type things that, like the fluorescent like dideoxynucleotide method or whatever um, but yeah so you can use this fluorescent readout um, but for my purposes I am planning to do like the, the old school way and so with this old school way you have either you typically have a radio label primer but you can also have use um, when you give the, you have to give the reverse transcriptase, the DNA letters, the new dioxynucleotides to use to make that cDNA. And so you can give it radioactively labeled ones and then your whole thing is going to be labeled. But either way, you're going to see a signal and you're going to see a signal that is then going to, you can compare that to the size of, because you're gonna have bigger things up here in your gel because this gel mesh, so this is um, typically like a page gel. So like it's a denaturing page gel, so polyacrylamide gel. 
Um, and so it's going to be this mesh. And so bigger things are going to travel slower because they're going to get caught up more in it, whereas the smaller things are going to travel faster. And so the bigger things are going to be higher up and the smaller things are going to be lower down. Um, one thing that can get kind of confusing is that the ribosome, so you can get information about where the where the ribosome, where in like really, really granular detail about where a ribosome is actually located. So the ribosome has these three sites, these E, P, and A sites. And in the process of translation, the, the growing chain is going to initially be held in this um, P site. And then the new tRNA with the next amino acid to be added is going to come in this A site. And you're going to get the handoff from the P to the A, and then everything's going to shift over. The E site, um, the old one's going to get um, kicked out of the E site, and then you have this over and over, and you have the help with some exchange factors. So where the ribosome is bound, it's going to, basically, there's going to be extra room that the ribosome is sitting on around. The sites are like in the center of it, and or and then you have like all the stuff around it. And so, when you're seeing the reverse transcriptase, it can't go all the way to where the tRNA is actually located. It's going to stop where it hits the ribosome. And so, this can, it's going to be like 13 to 18 nucleotides downstream of this p position, um, depending on the species of the ribosome and the ribosome conformation and that sort of thing. Um, so, this means that when you run these gels, you're going to actually see the signal is not going to correspond to the letter that you see over here, is not going to correspond to where the ribosome is actually stopped. So, for example, with these gels, what you're seeing here is these ACTG. These are basically your letter ladder control lanes, these like sequencing lanes. So you do the reaction, you do the reverse transcription, but you use um, you spike in radio labeled A for this one, C for this one, T for this one, or G for this one. This is just like typical. Um, Standard sequencing type stuff. And importantly, um, I forgot to mention earlier, these are like dideoxy um, nucleotides that you're adding, the labeled nucleotides. So dideoxy, so normal deoxy means you don't have this 2 prime OH that the RNA has. Um, and then the dideoxy, so the second deoxy is going to be this 3 prime OH group. And this 3 prime OH group is what the letters need to hook up together. And so if you don't have that, then you can't um, hook up. And so these chain terminator nucleotides, um, these use dideoxy nucleotides in Sanger sequencing. Um, and so when you send something for sequencing nowadays, they typically have like a fluorescent label. Um, but the ones that when you're doing a radioactive gel, then you have this be like phosphor, um, you have this um, B phosphor, this B on um, this phosphorus be radioactive. And then you can have a radioactive letter added. And then what's going to happen is you're going to have them be terminating at different places. So you spike in a little bit. And then when that little bit, when that gets added, then you're going to, it'll be labeled and it'll also, you'll have these different size pieces. And so you'll have these different size pieces because it'll be like stopping here this time. And then, but then this time it'll be stopping over here. And then you have these for each of the different letters. So when you're doing like a fluorescent thing, often these days they have, you can actually mix these if you use different fluorophores. But when you're doing it radioactively, um, they're all going to look the same because you just are going to be like scanning this gel to see the signal. And when you have this, so this way, you run a, one lane with the A, one C, one T, one G, and then the bigger things are going to be up here and the smaller things are going to be down here. And so then you can read the gel out. Um, just uh, note that the because these are dideoxynucleotides and the other nucleotides in your reaction are going to be deoxynucleotides, um, they're going to run a little different. So then you have to do some sort of normalization to figure out where the difference is between them, um, like what the shift is in terms of the run size. Um, and yeah, but that is the, that, that's the gist of how these things work.
Um, and another note is that if you do look at like a singer sequencing gel, there you're typically reading it like from top to bottom, but here you're reading it from bottom to top in terms of five prime to three prime. And that's because you're doing this reverse transcription. So we're going from the from the three prime end to the five prime end um, because this is going to be like, we're making the complementary DNA. We're not making copies of the forward stream. Okay, that was just a tech note. Um, and now back to the story. And what's gonna happen then is that you're going to get the A's labeled, but you because you have a low concentration of it, you're going to have, sometimes this A will get labeled, sometimes this A will get labeled, sometimes this A will get labeled, sometimes this A will be labeled. And so then you're going to see this ladder where you see the positions of all of the A's. Um, then you do this for the C's, the T's, and the G's. And now you can do your thing and then compare where your thing is compared to that. But because of this extra bulk, where you see a band is actually going to be a product that is shorter than the product that you would actually expect because the reverse transcriptase can't get all the way to here. So you have three nucleotide letters is going to be a codon and that's going to like spell one amino acid or one protein letter. And so for example, the start codon that also codes for methionine, this ATG, the signal for where you would see the ribosome bound to it is actually going to be all the way down here. And so typically when you see one of these gels, they'll have annotated it for you so that this is going to be the, the corresponding to what it would actually be. And then also because typically because these gels are going to be a lot longer and they'll have this, this is going to be like some sort of inset or outset or whatever you call those, like kind of a zoom in type of thing. And I'll show you some examples in a minute. But first, I want to point out some of the things that you can see with this technique. So one of them is, so basically you're going to see where the ribosome is stalled or the, where the ribosome is taking more time. Um, so you, this can either be because it naturally does or because you're causing it to. So you can, for like seeing, you can use this technique to look at initiation sites. And so often we think about initiation, like typically it's happening as this like canonical ATG um, initiation site for the canonical open reading frame or ORF. And so you might see the term ACORF, annotated canonical open reading frame. But there can also be alternative reading frames. Um, and so there's like upstream open reading frames or UORFs. Um, and so basically these are upstream of the um, of the five prime or sorry upstream of the AC ORF and I'm planning to do a post more on these later um, because they're pretty cool but anyway um, so you can have these alternative start sites and with toe printing you're able to actually see some of these as well you can get the inter you can get the ribosomes to stop at translation at initiation points if you use a drug like cyclohexamide, at concentrations that'll inhibit elongation, but not initiation. Um, there's some other drugs you can use too, um, but this is going to lead up to a big old up of the start codons. And so you can detect those initiation sites. Um, so typically when um, you run one of these gels, so like you have some sort of negative control. So up here, you're gonna see the full length cDNA. So this is if the ribosome, if the, if it, um, the ribosome like wasn't, wasn't there, wasn't working. So like high magnesium will inhibit translation. And so you'll see that you'll get this full length cDNA because there's nothing that the reverse transcriptase is going to run into. Um, and because remember, big things are up here, small things are down here. If you add cyclohexamide, you can see the main start site. You might also be able to detect initiation at an upstream open reading frame. Um, so this would be like this. So you can see here, this would be the five prime ETR. And again, this is, we're imagining here that the annotation has already been adjusted to take into account this stuff with the um, size. And you would also have your ATGC thing here. Um, okay, so you can see those initiations when you add the cyclohexamine. You can also, with this technique, detect stall sites. So ribosomes can stall for various reasons. They can stall for like unfavorable codons. So maybe if they have to wait for a rare tRNA to come or they're running low on that amino acid. They can also stall for cool reasons like the nascent peptide. So the peptide that's coming out of the ribosome. And so although in pictures we often draw it with just like there's like a single um, amino acid there or whatever in these cartoons, there's actually like 40 or so um, that are actually hanging out, um, coming out of that tunnel 
leaving the ribosomes, like I like to think of it as kind of like a chimney and you have like 40 amino acids in that tunnel. And sometimes if you have um, amino acids, there are various amino acids, things like prolines, um, some charged amino acids as well. They're kind of these awkward sequences. Um, sometimes there are these things called like arrest peptides and basically they make the ribosome stall because they're kind of like awkward inside of the ribosome. In some cases, as we'll look at this cool one with the bacterial um, resistance, cells can be induced by specific drugs or metabolites. And so um, cells can use it as a kind of like regulatory um, thing. And sometimes this has to do with two with translation in the five prime PR of like an up upstream open ribbon frame. So there's some really cool stuff that you can do um, and that you can measure with this technique and stuff. Um, but so you can see inherent stall points um, as well as if you add like a thing that induces the stall. So in the case of one of those um, like metabolites or specific drug interactions that are going to stall it, um, then you can see those stall points. And then you can also see termination sites because termination is slow. Um, and so you can also sometimes maybe see premature termination. So this technique is sometimes used to study things like premature termination. So now let's look at some actual examples. Okay, so this was like the original paper, at least I think, um, from Hertz, McBeaters, Trout, and Gold in 1988. Um, this study, and they were looking with at this like T4 um, phase, so this bacteria infecting virus. But you can see that, um, so yeah, you have like this sort of like outset because these, there's going to be a lot more bands and you can like easily show, um, you can easily label and still have people be able to see it. Um, but one of the coolest uses of this that I is like, this paper just like blows my mind. It's so cool. Um, this like molecular mechanism of drug dependent ribosome stalling uh, by Nora Vasquez Laslop, um, Celine Thum, and Alexander uh, Mankin. So in this, they're looking at these bacteria um, that have this erythromycin resistance genes. Um, so these like ERM. Um, so basically they, erythromycin is an antibiotic drug and these bacteria are able to make this antibiotic resistance um, thing, like this antibiotic, um, this protein that'll provide, antibi that'll provide res resistance to this antibiotic, but they'll only make it in the presence of this antibiotic. And so how this works is because there's this up, so upstream, so this ERM-C, this is going to be the resistance. Um, this is going to make the resistance product that they need to be resistant. But upstream of this, you have this like leader peptide, this leader upstream um, reading frame. So this ERM-CL, how erythromycin works is it binds to the ribosome. And so the ERM-C is actually going to provide, make this methyltransferase that is going to alter the ribosome so that with methylation so that the antibiotic can't bind. If you have but in order to do that, the ERMC has to be made, but you don't want to make ERMC if you don't need it and you won't need it unless there's erythromycin present. So how it works, so you have this upstream open reading frame. You have this like leader peptide. And so this ERMCL, this leader peptide, if it's just like transcribed, norm, translated normally, then the ribosome is going to be, the, the RNA is going to be in this shape and it's going to have this structure that the secondary structure that's going to hide the ERM-C, um, hide the start site for ERM-C. And so you're not gonna get the ERM-C made. But in the presence of the drug, then the ribosome is actually going to stall here. And when it stalls here, it's going to change the structure, the secondary structure of the RNA and cause it to adopt this alternate conformation where you then expose the start site for RMC and get that translated. And you can actually see this. So before the study, they didn't know like exactly what was going on, but here they can see the exact um, toe print from where it's actually sitting. And you can see when you increase the amount, you see an increase in here. And so this is a, an example, a really, really awesome example. Um, and then they do more experiments showing like what is required, um, which parts of the ribosome are interacting, which parts of the RNA, um, very, very, really cool stuff. Um, and so cool paper. And then there's also been other papers that have um, done really cool work too. Um, so this is another from those same researchers and um, a few others. And they're actually using this, now they have this 
this they're using like a pure system so with that um, like reconstituted system with all the purified translation components and then they're making different changes to the sequence and getting it trying to find drugs that'll stall at um, that'll inhibit the um, trans amino acid tRNA synthetase. So basically the thing, the enzyme that puts the amino acids on their corresponding tRNAs. And so then they could see that when they have these inhibitors of these various tRNA synthetases, um, they, they're getting it stopped at specific letters um, because they run out of that um, of that TR loaded tRNA to use. And so here, I just want to show this because you can see that the stall point that you detect is going to be upstream of the actual thing that you see. And this is a nice methods paper too, as well, going over um, some of the techniques and how to interpret these gels. And so I'll put a link to this one as well and a link to um, like a fluorescent based um, method where they have these fluorescently labeled um, primers instead of radioactively labeled and then they do like capillary gel electrophoresis. Um, and so yeah, so this is also something that is used. Um, and yeah, so lots of really, really cool stuff. Um, these are just a couple examples. And yeah, so hope that helped you understand some of the differences and similarities between some of these techniques and some of the cool stuff that you can do as well as some just cool biochemistry. Okay, now it's work done.